Well, it is a great honor to have Mark and Tara Little and their family with them with us today, and it's a great honor to have Brother Mark to come and preach for us this morning. I first met him uh, down at Cedar Grove Baptist Church, where uh, John Hunter is the pastor. He was speaking in a Mid-South Fellowship meeting there, and he preached from Luke chapter 5, where the Lord taught the disciples how to fish, and they brought in such a drought that it broke their net, where Peter said, depart from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. Tremendous message. I will never forget it. And I've heard him preach since. I know that most of you have not heard Brother Mark, but we, you have read at least one article that he wrote on She is a Great Sinner in our uh, publication, The Messenger. <clears throat> so you're not total strangers to his ministry. But he's been a blessing to me these four years that I have known him and wanted to have him to come and speak for us here. Excuse my voice, I'm glad I'm not speaking this morning. <clears throat> that was providential. <laughs> um, but I'm glad that they were able to accept this invitation and come and speak for us and be a part of our conference. Uh, you're going to, as you get to know them this week and fellowship with them, you're going to love them even more, but we love these who preach the gospel for the gospel's sake that they preach. And uh, Mark is an outstanding preacher of the gospel, loves the Lord, walks with the Lord. I had the privilege of being in their church, uh, the Dominion Baptist Church, there in Birmingham uh, four years ago, and uh, three and a half, whatever. But uh, beautiful church, lovely people and uh, reflect uh, their pastor uh, in, in every good way. But we're glad to have their pastor with us today to preach for us. Brother Mark Little, he is the pastor of Dominion Baptist Church in Birmingham. Well, it is a delight to be here. Set up shop here. It was a delight to have your pastor down with us, preaching on the minor prophets in that conference. And uh, every pastor needs a pastor to listen to sermons, and your pastor is one of them that I like to go to for his expositions of the word. So I appreciate it very, very much. And delighted to be a part and to be able to take part and, and listen for your 51st conference and uh, these fellows that I appreciate so much that are going to be here with you. And I also appreciate the welcome you gave us last night with uh, bringing some tornadoes in, or <laughs> since we're from Alabama, felt right at home. <laughs> and uh, we were in there in the restaurant and Tom was facing this way, I was facing out the window <laughs> watching it come in. And afterwards I said, now Tom, Whenever that lightning hits, it's like the whole sky is red. What does that mean? And he just said, well, I'm not sure, but it's probably not good. <laughs> so, but we are used to them. We have them too. So uh, it's a delight to be with you all. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. The writer of the Hebrews is giving some short statements. He begins with, let brotherly love continue, and then be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity, as being yourself also in the body. And then a text I want us to consider uh, this contrast that's made in verse 4. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Let's pray. We thank you, Father, for your word. Your word is truth. 
a lamp to our feet, a light to our path, that which sanctifies us, sets us apart for thy glory. We ask, Lord, that you would teach us, that you would help me in the preaching of the word and the congregation and the hearing of it. And we ask for your, your help, your grace. We pray that you'd forgive our sins, that you would cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that you would lead us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. We give you praise and thanks and honor. This is your day. This is the day that the Lord has made. We are glad and we rejoice in it. And so teach us now, O Lord, grant us uh, thy, thy voice, we pray in the name of Christ our Lord, amen. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse four, we read, marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefined undefiled. Marriage is valuable. Marriage is something precious. And the bed is undefiled. It's not stained. Not stained. So he gives us this contrast between the marriage and the marriage bed and then goes on to speak of but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. So why does the Holy Spirit move the writer of the Hebrews to speak to the church and to say to the church itself that marriage is honorable, that marriage is valuable. Why does the church need this message? And that the marriage bed is not defiled, it's not stained. And I think the reason the Holy Spirit gives this to the church is because man has twisted the whole idea of marriage and the marriage bed I heard recently uh, a man, a comedian talking about there's one, uh, one out of every two marriages fail. And he says, well, if, if, if you found out that one, every, every, one out of every two parachutes failed, you wouldn't go up and jump. And of course he got his laugh concerning marriage. But the reality is, is that it is God's institution and that it is valuable and it is precious and it's not God's institution that's at the fault of the one out of the two. It is man that is at fault there. But man has twisted marriage and he's also twisted the marriage bed. He's twisted sexual intimacy. Why is this always under attack? Why do we have, if you want to talk about a pandemic, we have a pandemic of pornea in our land, of sexual sin in our land. That's the pandemic that we have. And why? Why is this always under attack? It's under attack because the picture given to us in Holy Scripture is Christ and his church. And it's a beautiful picture. And therefore, the evil one would like to distort that and twist that in the hearts and minds and lives of men and women. And false religion has degraded marriage and the marriage bed as well. The world has so twisted God's institution of marriage and sexuality that the Holy Spirit must assure the church that marriage is honorable, it's valuable, the marriage bed is undefiled, literally it's not stained, it is free from that by which the nature of a thing is defiled and debased, or its force and vigor impaired. It's not the problem of the institution. The institution is right and holy and good and given to us by God for a legitimate issue and for the benefit of society. And it's one of the many reasons our society is crumbling at this point. But the Holy Spirit also says that the sexually immoral and adulterers, God will judge. So what pushes sexual immorality in our culture? I would say one of the great pushers of sexual immorality, and has been for a while, is pornography. Now, when I was a boy growing up, you know, pornography, it came before the, before the highest court of the land when I was younger, and the, and the nine justices there never could define pornography, so they never would do anything with it. Well, the word for sexual immoral is pornus from the root pornas, 
a man who sells himself for immorality. 1 Corinthians 6.18 says, flee sexual immorality. Pornean, which according to the lexicon is the root of the English term pornography. We get porno and graphic. And it is this selling off or surrendering of sexual purity. Pornography or graphic is to write about something immoral, to write about this twisted sexuality. In our text, where it talks about the sexual immoral are going to be judged, pornea and moxia are both mentioned from the Greek. One of them is marital, marital unfaithfulness or adultery. And the other one, pornea, is a more general term for just all the different kinds of sexual immorality that there is. The topic of pornography and immorality, immoral sexuality, is a very uncomfortable topic for many people, but it's a great reality in our society. The Holy Scriptures clearly teach there is such a thing as sexual immorality. Our society wants to make it amoral as though it doesn't make a difference either way, but it makes a great difference. In fact, the scripture itself says that this particular sin is a very special sin because it sins against your own body, against your own soul, as it were. And God tells us this pornea is as old as the earth itself. The ancients made it a part of their religion, sexual immorality. To be a Corinthian was to understand that you were sexually immoral. And so that part and parcel of their religious gatherings had to do with sexual immorality. God tells us to flee it. Now, down in Alabama, if you're in the woods and you see a bear, you flee it. So you flee it because you're in danger. So God says that sexual immorality is a dangerous thing and you are to flee it. And God also tells us that those who practice sexual immorality, that that is their life, they will not inherit God's kingdom. They will not be a part of God's kingdom. Mark tells us it's from within, from the heart, one of the many sins that come from within our hearts. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 says that it's God's will to abstain from it. So we don't have any problem here of knowing whether it's right or whether it's wrong, whether it's God's will or not God's will. It's not God's will, sexual immorality. In Ephesians 5, 3, it says, let it not be once named among you as saints. And yet it was named among the Corinthian saints, wasn't it? In fact, he said, it's named, not only named among the Corinthian saints, but such a case of it that even the Gentiles would blush at it. Both men and women are involved in pornography. Women are generally seduced by stories of romance in which pornea or sexual immorality is written about. Men are generally seduced by visuals. Satan enslaves multitudes from time memorial. But in our slot of time of history, there has arisen a device which makes pornea, or sexual immorality, or pornography, more accessible than at any time in the history of the world. That these little devices here allow men and women in the privacy, they think, of their homes or their cars to enter into pornography, though God sees. So this is, this is a great temptation and this is a great danger for our generation. And it is bringing in billions of dollars of revenue on account of it. I think most of us are aware at how great the temptation is and how pervasive it is throughout the land. But what I find is that most Christians do not talk to their children about sexuality. And that is problematic because the enemy will talk to them, and they will get information eventually from TV, magazines, internet, friends, which is not helpful. In fact, it's actually downright false what they get. In fact, it's twisted sinfully. 
And it always is separated from God's reality for sexuality. So why do we avoid the subject? Why do Christians even find it so hard to talk to their children about this subject? And I think part of the answer, at least, goes back to the Garden of Eden, as all things do. Adam and Eve was created, were created without shame. Their sexuality had no tint of shame. We can hardly understand that. And they were, it says they were both naked and not ashamed. But then they fell into an estate of sin. And what did they do? They were immediately ashamed of their sexuality as they tried to cover themselves. They knew somehow, intuitively, the great change that had taken place. And they were naked. That is, metaphorically, they were certainly naked before God. They were open sinners before God, and they knew now they needed to be ashamed for what they had done before God. But Adam and Eve, who had never sinned by sexual immorality, instinctively covered themselves as a foreboding of things to come in the world. And God, of course, covered them with the skins of an animal, the sacrifice, to show that there is, there is a sacrifice for this sin as well. Some may think that this sin cannot be overcome. Some think that this sin may, cannot be forgiven. But yes, indeed, even this sin can be forgiven. Even this sin can be overcome by uh, the song we heard about the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is our hope. That is our only hope. This, for Christian parents, I think, they struggle with talking about sexual immorality or just about the sexuality of their children, even when they're little and they're coming up with questions. And I think part of it is because Christian parents at times have baggage themselves they have baggage in their past of sexual immorality, which causes them to be very reticent to talk about the whole subject for various reasons. They may think they're not qualified to talk about it because of their sins of their past. Uh, they may be worried about talking about it, thinking that if they talk about it, it's going to increase the sins of their children. Uh, there's lots of reasons why parents, I think, have that. But children need a right instruction about our sexuality. We are talking about and we'll be looking at the um, Song of Solomon a little bit as well because what we're looking at is the lure of sexual sin, but also there has to be a cure for sexual sin. And the cure has to be that which is ordained of God and is pure and right and holy, not only in the human realm, but then something that transcends all of that in the divine realm as well. Little girls are prepared somewhat for their sexuality because of the hygiene that they have to care for. Little boys at times are woefully prepared for their sexuality and we need help from the Lord to be able to renew our minds and recognize that this topic of sexuality is not inherently dirty or sinful, but return this area to Christian instruction and stewardship of the Lord. I have purposely asked myself this question, why do men and women use pornography? And I ask the question so that I can understand what is, what is our weakness? What is the weakness of our own flesh? What are the devices of Satan that he uses in order to lure us in to the use of pornography? Which I say is, is the ground and foundation for much sexual sin. When I was in college centuries ago, did a study on crime and sexuality you know, and it was, it was obvious back then that pornographic users eventually were the highest abusers of mankind in criminal acts of sexuality. And it's the same today. It has just increased. Now, to the point to where when I was a boy, I could go out and play all day long anywhere in my little town and my mom and dad never had a thought for it. And I would never think of doing that with my little girls because of the sexual trafficking that's going on and everything else. We are concerned, aren't we? 
Well, we need to understand Satan's devices and our own weaknesses as well. And we need to answer them. Now, why do men and women use pornography? I would say, first of all, it's curiosity. Curiosity. I can say that that's how I got into it as a boy. Both curiosity and also the fact that I had relatives that gave me access to it. Curiosity is a beautiful thing. It is a God-given gift by which rational creatures explore their world. And Satan exploits this for his own purposes. Most children are introduced to pornography by their curiosity. Sad to say, there are also older children or adults that by a sinful curiosity, take them to pornea websites. Christian parents and homeschooling parents, we count on curiosity in order to teach our children because they ask a thousand questions, sometimes much to our distress all day long because they're filled with curiosity. So curiosity is a beautiful thing and it's a wonderful thing and we need to understand the power of curiosity and the power of the supercomputer that God put in your child's head called a brain. If your child feels as though you don't want to talk about sexuality, then they won't look for that information from you. Or if you put them off or say, just we don't, want, we don't talk about those things. But they will probably find out information elsewhere. But we need to use the natural curiosity that God has given them to instruct them about their bodies. Okay. Our bodies, we have indwelling sin. It's a fight with our bodies. So they need to understand about their bodies that their body is to be given wholly to the Lord. It's created by God. It is something that is to be used for his glory. It can be abused as well that he did make us sexual beings, despite the fact that we're having a hard time these days figuring out what a boy and a girl is, the scripture doesn't have any problem with that. I don't have any problem with that. I can tell you the difference there. And I can tell you that the reproductive system that God has put in the human body is a wondrous thing. And this is one of the ways in which perhaps you can approach your children if you find it difficult talking to them about these things is that you, there are some wonderful studies out there, Answers in Genesis, Master's Books, a lot of resources now that you could take your children through and begin to teach them at age-appropriate times about the reproductive system that God has put there so that they don't come into a marriage situation, which my wife and I have known young ladies and young men who actually are married and they don't even understand the reproductive system yet. That's not helpful. So curiosity. Curiosity is a good thing. It just needs to be channeled. A second reason people use pornography is loneliness. But you know what? Pornography never solves loneliness. It actually increases your loneliness because it separates you out from all of real society. It will hinder you in making actual friends. It isolates you. And once it isolates you and Satan has you in that situation of isolation, then it can bring on depression, it can bring on suicidal thoughts, it can bring on criminal thoughts, all kinds of things, because you've isolated yourself from society. And that society in which God has placed you, especially the church, is to be that place in which you are nurtured in holy things. So pornography, people tell me, well, I went there because I was lonely. It doesn't help your loneliness. You cannot... Once you get addicted to that stuff, you cannot look at the opposite sex properly. You cannot make friends properly. So if you think you're going there for that reason, you need to reprove your own flesh, reprove Satan, and you need to repent of that and recognize that he is only damaging you. He is not helping you. The church is the best of places to cultivate good and godly friendships. And God is a father to the fatherless. And the church is a family in which we find fellowship if we are lonely. Some have the experience of rejection by someone of the opposite sex. And so their hopes were dashed. And therefore they go into pornea because there's no fear of rejection there. Because it's not a real relationship. Because it's just a fantasy. 
And this touches on the providence of God. That that person who is going to this sinful pattern of behavior is rejecting the reality of the providence of God who didn't want you with that person and who has somebody else for you then. Laziness is a prominent reason for the use of pornea. You know why? Because real relationships take work. That's why. Real husband-wife relationships, real courting relationships, they take work and they take grace and they take the grace of God in your life to work with that other person and talk with that other person and learn how to work out things. So it's laziness. And Proverbs 13, 4 says, the soul of the sluggard desires, but he has nothing. Because those that are lazy and go to pornea, they will have nothing. No real relationship. No joy of that fellowship which God has ordained for relationships. Evil company corrupts good habits. Some enter into it that way. A lack of self-control feeds a pornographic addiction. But Peter says for the Christian, according as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Is someone addicted? Are you addicted to this? Is there any hope should you give up? No, we know the one who walked upon the sea. We know the one who calmed the angry sea. We know the one who cast out demons. We know the one who has all power in heaven and in earth. Yes, there is, even for this sin, there is forgiveness and there is victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. We do not need to live in a fantasy world, folks. And these virtual worlds in which some of our children are growing up in and getting involved in are not healthy. Because the Christian has been called to face reality and to deal with reality, not live in a fantasy. Because the fantasy is just that. It is a fantasy. It is uh, that which is not real and cannot be real. And the scripture teaches us in Philippians 4, 8, when he talks about what we should think on, the very first word there, he says, think on these things, that which is true. And the Greek word means that which is actual, not a fantasy, but that which is actual. Some go into it for pleasure, but the pleasure of pornea is spoiled by the aftertaste of bitterness and shame and emptiness. The pleasure of pornea is a lie because it diminishes in time and then forces you to conserve even darker stuff. The scripture says Moses chose to suffer the afflictions with the people of God rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season because they are but for a season and they are diminishing. What you need to escape pornea is a greater pleasure, is a higher pleasure than that. And the things of the spirit are higher than the things of the flesh. The things of God are higher than the things of man. You need divine pleasures and heavenly pleasures. David said in Psalm 1611, in thy presence is fullness of joy and at thy right hand pleasures forevermore. You want pleasures? Then you need to get to know the one true and living God whom we know through Jesus Christ our Lord. Because you need something that's divine and you need something that's transcendent. There are plenty of earthly pleasures and these earthly pleasures in and of themselves are not necessarily wrong. As the writer of the Hebrews said, the marriage bed is not stained. And there is sexual pleasure within the marriage bed, which is fine, and it is good, and it is under God. But there is still even greater pleasures than that are those transcendent pleasures in which we get to know and have fellowship and intimacy with the one true and living God. And for those who are either addicted to this stuff or they seem to, that they have a, this propensity to go back to it, a besetting sin, I think this is one of the great cures for that. You have to have something greater than that pleasure. And fellowship with the eternal God is a transcendent pleasure, which if you will enter into it, you will find that that 
pleasure outshines these other little earthly pleasures. So we need a living, loving relationship to Jesus Christ. A pleasure higher than sinful pleasure to know God in his purity. Turn in your Bibles to the book of the Song of Solomon. We've just embarked on this book on our Wednesday nights. I told your pastor this has been the most difficult book for me to wrestle with and, and to come to uh, proper applications. This, the book of the Song of Solomon, it's about the woman who is called a Shulamite and her beloved, her beloved. And it is love idealized in the human experience, part of it. Part of it is this idea of, of love idealized, fresh love, new love, first love, where he says, I see nothing wrong in you, and you are beautiful, and you are wonderful. And in uh, the Bambi movie, it's your Twitter pated, I think is what they use. Because the reality is, is that while you have this fresh and strong love, and then people get married and they live with each other, two sinners under the same household, they begin to see the faults and the problems and all the warts, and then they, they realize they need the grace of God to maintain this relationship and to maintain a proper love for one another. So the Song of Solomon gives us an idealized love, but beyond that, the analogy which we make and we apply it then is it's not just love idealized, it's love realized in the Lord Jesus Christ toward his church. Because there is such a love, even though it's idealized for us as men and we struggle with even maintaining a proper love relationship toward the one that we covenanted with all the days of our life, yet there is a love relationship and a covenant which has been made between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, a covenant that will never be broken, and a covenant that is, is as strong as death, and a covenant in which God, the force of God's love, is never abated toward his church. We don't understand that kind of love unless we have been born again of the Spirit of God and we have experienced ourselves the love of God shed abroad in our hearts. Song of Solomon in the first, first chapter. So your pastor, I hear, has been through this with some a couples, I think, group recently. So we'll just do a little bit of a, a review on some of this. Because what I, want, what I want you to take home today is this, is that this pornea is a very real and present danger. And it is a great evil, and it touches so many lives but that there is an answer to this, and there is a transcendent love that can obliterate that desire that you have to hit that button, to go to that website, to look at those pictures or read about those things in a novel. He begins the text, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. As one commentator said, that, that she wasn't desiring right at that moment an inductive Bible study with this man. She actually wanted to kiss him. See? And it wasn't the kiss of the church. It wasn't the kiss of fellowship that's spoken of in the New Testament. This is intimate sexual love. She wants to kiss him with the kisses of her mouth. And what that teaches us is very simply this, is that there is such a thing as sexual love that God has given to us. And it's not evil, and it's not wicked, and it's not filthy, and it's not dirty. When it is between a man and a woman who have covenanted together, it is something beautiful. But that beyond that, the Puritans used to talk about the kisses of Christ, the kisses of God through Christ, that there is a transcendent intimacy that transcends even the human intimacy that God has given to us. He says, your love is better than wine. This love that he, they had together, the man and the woman, was better than all the other earthly pleasures that God had set up. And God has set up many earthly pleasures for us. The food that we eat, 
the taste buds that we have, the sunshine that we see, the smell of the fresh rain, all these things hit our senses and they are the goodness of God to us. Joys, joys, immeasurable he gives to us and even to the unbeliever in this world. But she says, this love is something better than wine, something better than these other earthly things. And then there is the divine love, which transcends even that human relationship in love, which transcends the others. Because he says in verse, she says in verse 3, because of the savor of thy good ointments, thy name is as an ointment poured forth. Thy name. Thy name is like the ointments. Thy name is like the beautiful fragrances and smells. Because the name represented the character of a person. You know God used to name people throughout the scriptures. And he would name them according to the character that they would have. Intimacy in a human relationship has to do with character. Because you can marry somebody and you can marry the, the bombshell, whatever the world thinks is the most beautiful woman, whatever. But if there is no character there, that lust will fade away so quickly. So that within the marriage relationship too, the marriage bed is undefiled and it's a beautiful thing, but it's only a beautiful thing as throughout the day, the character of those individuals are loving each other and caring for each other. Because if they've been nasty to each other all day long, the marriage bed isn't going to look like much. And so it's the character. And when we think of the divine love, it is the character and nature of God. And when we think upon the character and nature of God, there is nothing but perfections to love. Which is why his name, the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, is like an ointment poured forth. It is a fragrance. And so she says, draw me, draw me in. And this is our desire, that God would draw us in. In verse 5 and 6, she is concerned about the tanning of her skin because she's been put out to take care of the vineyards. It's not, a, it's not an ethical or racial thing. It's, it's the fact that she was out in the sun. When you're out in the sun, you tan. And so she's, she's conscious of the fact of these defects, and the saints are conscious of their defects before God. We are conscious of the fact that we are not a beautiful thing. But that we see what happens is that he sweeps all of this away because he says in verse 8, if you know not, thou fairest among women. Thou fairest among women. Now there's an idealized love, but it's a realized love of God and Christ and Christ to his church who calls his church the fairest among women. And we're conscious of our sins. He is conscious of the righteousness that he has placed upon us. And that our beauty and our fragrance all comes from him. And in verse 7, she says, Tell me, O thou whom my soul loves, where you feed. It's a geographical thing. Where you, I want to know where you are. I want to be with you. I, want, I need to be with you. Because intimacy has to be about being with the person. You know, the old, in the old movies, the, the, the stereotypical dad or husband at the table with the paper in front of his face, and he's just not there, is he? Even when he's there, he's not there. Because he's paying attention to everything else except his wife and kids. When Christ chose his disciples, the text of Scripture says he chose them to be with him. With him. And so her desire is that she would be with her lover. And of course, this translates to the desire that the saints have to be with God, to have fellowship with God. And this is a necessary thing for our relationship, our intimacy with Christ. And in verse eight, she, verse seven, she says, where are you? I don't know where you are. I don't know where you feed your flock and you rest your flock but indicating the fact that she knows he is a good shepherd, that he gives his, his sheep, as Matthew Henry says, repast and repose. He gives them food and he gives them rest. She knows that. And she wants to be with him. 
He says in verse 8, If you do not know, O fairest among women, go thy way by the footsteps of the flock. If you want to find me, find out where the flock are going. Follow the footsteps of the flock and you will find me. It makes sense. Makes sense for the saints as well. You want to know where the Lord Jesus Christ is? Find out where the flock goes. The flock is here this morning. They come here because they want to hear the master's voice, because they want to hear the Lord Jesus Christ. They want to sense his presence. They want to know his presence, the presence of God through Christ. The footsteps of the flock lead into the prayer closet, Christ says. Go in and shut the door. That's where the saints go. That's where the footsteps of the saints are. They're in the prayer closet. They're with the Lord, having fellowship with God. You want to find the shepherd? Go into the prayer closet. You want to find the shepherd? Go to where the public gathering of the saints are. These are the footsteps of the flock. Find a God-fearing man and woman and see what they do. See where they go. See how they counsel. You need counsel concerning these things? Go to those who are God-fearing. Follow the footsteps of the flock. And then, I want you to go to verse 12. In verse 12, it says, While the king sits at his table, while the king sits at his table, my spikenard sendeth forth the smell thereof, this fragrance. A bundle of myrrh is my well-beloved unto me, he shall lie all night betwixt my breasts. My beloved is unto me as a cluster of camphor in the vineyards of Engedi. So she's at the king's table. Her fragrance is going forth. She notes in verse 13 that her well-beloved is like a bundle of this myrrh between her breasts all night long. Now, there's hardly a more intimate statement that could be made. Where does she get this fragrance that she gives off? She gets it from her beloved, who is betwixt her breasts. She gets it as the church because of Christ, because of Christ dwelling in the church, with the church, over the church, around the church, everywhere, this fellowship that we have in Jesus Christ. And I think it's significant that it says the king is sitting at his table and she is there and her fragrance is going forth because the scriptures abound with this idea of the table and the fellowship at the table and that all of salvation itself, when Christ saves us, he doesn't save us just so that we can do certain things. He saves us to be with him. He saves us to have fellowship with him. I'm in the Father, and you're in me. And so he invites us into this perfect fellowship that he and the Father have. And then he says, and you come on in with us. This is the way in. Well, God set a table for Adam and Eve, didn't he? He set a table of the whole world. And he gave them the whole world. And he said, just don't touch this one tree. This was proof of their love. Just don't mess with this tree. And Satan said, you know, he doesn't really love you because he won't give you this tree. Oh, no, he does love you. And Satan was saying, you're really deficient unless you taste of this tree. But the fact was, is that the fact that they didn't taste of that tree meant they weren't deficient. It meant they had fellowship with God. But they lost that fellowship with God, didn't they? And then they were driven out of the garden. But what does God do? God immediately sets another table. And he sets the table of the sacrifice. And he says, now come and partake of this sacrifice. Because you know, the, the sacrifices in the Old Testament, many of them were also food for those who came to eat and partake. It was a meal together. And you were having fellowship with God because you were fellowshipping in this sacrifice. As Christ said, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can't have any part of me. You have to imbibe my doctrine. You have to take part of me. And as you enter into this sacrifice, we have fellowship one with another. It is restored. You are restored to God. A table 
In the temple, there was a table set up with 12 fresh loaves each week. And then there was incense that was poured on the hot coals and it went up to heaven and it was the prayers of the saints. And so there was bread there and there were prayers there and it was all about fellowship around the table once again. King David had a lot of people around his table. Remember Mephibosheth, the lame boy, the king brought the lame boy into his table. We're the lame boy. And the king has brought us into his table and he feeds us at his table. In 2 Kings chapter 4, you remember the prophet's chamber, one of my favorite stories of the woman who says to her husband, this man is a prophet, I want us to set up a room for him. It just had a few articles in it because ministers only need a few things, but one of them was a table because at that table he would partake of earthly bread to sustain himself, but he would also lay down his manuscripts so that he could partake of the word of God as well, so that he could preach and teach it as he went on his itinerant ministry. The greatest psalm of all, Psalm 23, thou preparest a table for me. Where? In the presence of my enemies. That there is no place on this earth and there is no situation on this earth and there is no situation so terrible that God can't make us a table and us partake in fellowship with him. Israel's great sin in Psalm 78 was to ask God this question, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? That was a terrible question. God had furnished a table in the wilderness and God still furnishes a table in the wilderness. And I'm telling you, Pornia is a wilderness. That will never Pornea will never make you happy. It will never make you not lonely. It will never help you. It won't help you in your marriage. It won't help you in your relationships to anybody. But what will is to be around the table of the Lord Jesus Christ and be furnished with good things from him. The woman in Canaan, she said, all I want is just crumbs from the table. If you just give me crumbs from the table, that's enough. And Christ honored her faith. Turn to Luke chapter 22 for a moment. Luke chapter 22. One of the many astounding passages of scriptures. Luke chapter 22, verse 29. Verse 28 says, You are those which have continued with me in my temptations, and I appoint unto you a kingdom, as my Father has appointed to me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on the thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So he has appointed a table, and he has appointed for us not only a, ta a kingdom, but a table to for us to partake and eat and drink at his table. And then turn to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12 and verse 36. Verse 35 says, let, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding that when he comes and knocks, they may, be op they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he comes, shall find watching. Verily I say to you that he will gird himself and make them sit down to meet and come forth and serve them. That's an astonishing verse. That the Lord of all glory will come and serve his people at the table. But we're not surprised by that because John 13, it says that the Lord Jesus Christ took the towel and he went around to all his servants because he loved them to the very end. Blessed are they that are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so the book of the Song of Solomon teaches us that there is, there are transcendent pleasures. 
And those pleasures are found around the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. Song of Solomon 2.4, he brought me into his banqueting table, his house of wine, his place of joy, and his banner over me is love. The banner was what the army looked to. You got to rally around the banner. We rally around the banner of the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You don't need to go to Pornia. You need to go to the banner of Christ's love. You need to rally around that. You need to find your comfort. You need to find your identity. You need to find everything that you need in this life and the life to come in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ in the love of God in Christ. Find that transcendent love and you will, by the grace of Christ, find something that's greater than all these temptations of the world when they say to you, here is love, here's what you need, here's what you need to lust after. No, we need to lust after, desire after the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So may God give us grace. May he give us grace to understand what a plague this thing is. And if somebody comes to you and says to you, and maybe somebody needs to come to you and say to you, I'm struggling with this, that you would not cast them off, that you would not act as though, you know, this isn't some kind of impossibility, but that you would take them, counsel them, lead them to the living waters, because I think this is where they're really going to beat that habit. They have to have salvation in Jesus Christ, and if they are a saint who from time to time has fallen into this sin, then they need to sh be shown that here are transcendent pleasures. And if you will carefully stay around the table of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will find you don't need these other things because it's a greater pleasure. May God help us. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the love of God in Christ. We thank you for the table that you have set for us of all good things for this life and also the life to come through our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for that redemption which cleanses us from all sin. If there be those, O oh Father, who are here today and who, are, who find themselves in the grip of this sin, we pray that you might come with power upon their soul and that you might impart to them life from above and that they might see the beauty of Christ that they might have the love of God of, uh, shed abroad in their hearts through Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen.